ahead and get started, open with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we're just grateful for another privilege, Lord, just to not only be in your house this morning, Father, to bring you glory, to dig into your word, Lord, just to draw closer to you. But Father, we thank you this morning for the word, the word that we can stand on. Father, we know that in this time that we are living, Father, there are so many uncertain things, so many things going on that we don't understand, Father. But your word is clear, your word is true, and we're grateful for that this morning. So we pray now, Father, that all of those under the sound of my voice, those that are present here in the sanctuary, Father, that you would open their hearts and their minds and their ears to receive what you would have them to receive this morning. Lord, just go before us. Bless us. Draw us closer to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so this morning we're going to get started. We're on page 65, and we're going to start with the paragraph here on page 65. And I want to, as I always have to do, I want to go and recap that just a little bit. And at the bottom of page 64, it says that in order for us to live a faithful life, there are many theological issues that we need to understand. Theological issues are absolutely vital to our faith, and a lot of these are the ones that are going to determine what we believe and how we act. So there are times that we need to focus on the theological issues. Let me define theological for you one more time. It is the systematic study of the divine of scriptural belief. So if we believe God's word, we have we want to study God's word. These things are vital to our faith. So, as we've already opened with prayer, we're going to be almost to the top of page 65. And let's talk about, there's no way that we can ever fully understand God. Now, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, speaks into this. Now, I'm going to read it in my New Living Translation. Before we get started, let, let me read this. Listen very carefully. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. It says, The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for these secrets, but we and our children are accountable forever for all that He has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. Now, let me read a little commentary. There are some secrets that God has chosen not to reveal to us, and they're for these reasons. Sometimes our minds cannot fully understand what God is trying to tell us. God's nature and His universe is a lot of times far and above anything that we can ever imagine. There are some things that are unnecessary for us to know until we become more mature. God is infinite, He is all-knowing, and we do not have the capacity of God to know everything. However, this verse shows that although God has told us everything there is to know at a certain point in time, He has told us that we need to obey Him. He has told us enough. Therefore, disobedience comes from an act of will, not from a lack of knowledge. My children used to always say to me, well, Mama, I didn't know. And I'm looking at them like, yes, you did. You did know. And there's a lot of things, especially in the world and the time that we're living in today. There, there's a big chasm, probably far greater than the Grand Canyon from right and wrong today. I mean, we see it. You turn on the TV and you see this and you're thinking, that is unbelievable. We've heard the story of the man just shooting the child in his front yard because he rode his bicycle through. Or somebody in the car shooting a baby in a stroller just because they can. This is evil. We certainly need to understand that these things are evil. There's no other way to describe it. So, through God's Word, we know enough, we know enough about Him to be saved by faith and to serve Him. 
We must not use the limitation of our knowledge as an excuse to reject his claim on our life. God has a purpose. We are called according to his purpose and to his glory. It's not about us. So as we continue on page 65, there are things that God, things about God that are mysterious and secret and that we will never know. But there are things that have been revealed and they belong to us. Now, let's talk about some of these things. There's no way that we can go through our studies. This is our third study, our third book into the Holy Spirit. There's no way that we're going to be able to learn everything. But we're going to learn what God wants us to learn. That's what verse 29 has just told us. That in your maturity, in God's time, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal things to us. I firmly believe that this book is for this time. The world is in great turmoil, great turmoil now. And what we need to understand is that while the world is in great turmoil, there are a lot of things going on that we don't understand and, and, and are very foreign to us because it's like the world seems to be totally out of control. Okay, so with that in mind, let's look at the purpose and why the Holy Spirit is so essential in your life. We're talking individual basis, how important it is for you, okay? Now, let's talk about some of the things that have been revealed Um, all right, getting back to it. We can edit this out, I'm sure. All right, now, know that even as you seek to understand the Spirit more, He is so much more and bigger than you will ever be able to grasp. This is not an excuse to stop seeking the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said, I came that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly, that purpose is knowledge and wisdom and the drawing and, and the drawing of closer to God. Okay? That there's purpose in all of those things. So the point is not to completely understand God, but to worship Him. One of the greatest things I think that we've learned is the Eucharist to give thanks. Eucharisto. Giving thanks at all times to God for all things. Because in all things, we can find good. Even in the bad things. You know, even when you're running late, sometimes, you know, it's like, I didn't expect this to happen. I'm just, I'm just bogged down in traffic and blah, blah, blah. And I need to be somewhere else at this particular time. Lord, I don't know what you've stopped me from getting into, but I thank you. It changes your whole mindset. It changes your whole frame of mind into one of frustration and aggravation, or it changes it to, you know what, I'm going to sit here and enjoy the time, okay? So let the very fact that you cannot know him fully lead you to praise him for his infamous and his grandeur. Now, as we come into this conversation, let's not forget that we tread on holy ground. What we're talking about this morning is holy ground. The Holy Spirit brought creation to life and continues to sustain it. As we read in the book of Job, the Spirit of God has made me the breath of the Almighty, and that has given us life, okay? Now, let's understand this. You can only keep reading. You can only keep studying. You can only keep worshiping. You can only keep serving under the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that indwells us, that gives us wisdom, that empowers us to do what we've been called to do. Now, God is not like anything that we know. Do, do, don't even let it cross your mind and say, well, you know, God is this. Well, the Bible says God is love. Well, the Bible says God can be angry. Well, the, God, well, the Bible says this about God, okay? Those are all absolute scriptural truths, okay? But when, we, but when we go to defining God, we pigeonhole him. 
He's so much more than that. He's, he's absolutely so much more than that, okay? Now, don't compare him to anything else. He is outside our realm of existence and thus outside our ability to pigeonhole or categorize him, okay? Understand these things. Now, <coughs> let's study some of the basic truths of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you who are listening say, well, you know, this is our third book. We, we know it. We pretty much know the basics of the Holy Spirit. Well, if we did, we would not be reading it in this book today. I know for a fact that God led me to this book, and each time I open it to study, my eyes are opened more and more. So apparently, as we talk about the basics of the Holy Spirit, there's something that we all need to get out of it. Okay? So let's find out what that might be. Now, the basic truths of the Holy Spirit goes back to Genesis. The Holy Spirit was a part of creation. We can trace his life all the way through the Old Testament. But we are going to start, and I always, I pretty much always say this each lesson. And the reason I repeat this is it's extremely important that we get this. We're going to start in the book of Acts where the Spirit descended and begin to indwell the disciples, begin to indwell the followers of Jesus Christ in the upper room. They were all together in one place. All together in one place. They were gathered. Okay? Now, they heard a mighty sound like a rushing wind that came from heaven, and it filled the entire house. Now imagine this. Jesus person that you spent the last three years following has been crucified. Now he came back for a little while and he talked to him. He said, now I'm going. I'm going to, God's going to send you a gift. I need you to wait. And like, I, like again, let me remind you, they are waiting on something that they really don't have a clue what they're waiting on. They don't know who, they don't know what, they don't know when. But they are together, and let's define together. They're not only together in the physical together in the spiritual and they are waiting and God comes in and blesses them with power the Holy Spirit the indwelling of the Holy Spirit gives you power that you can say Jesus and you can overcome you can say Jesus and you can overcome you can say Jesus and you can rebuke these are extremely important things that we need to understand that we have power, okay? Now, we know that they were scattered when Jesus was arrested, but now they've got their act together. They, they had a little more time with Jesus. He's gone, and they are waiting. They're gathered together, but in the flesh, there's confusion. Now, if you have no confusion in your life, you lost your mind. If there are things in this world that don't confuse you, I don't know who you think you are, but you're not God. We live in an evil world, and Satan is the author of confusion. He's going to try to play on your mind. Your mind is a battlefield, and that is absolutely what Satan wants. He wants your mind in confusion and turmoil. That's a basic fact. Let's remember that. Satan wants to kill Maim, destroy. That is what he wants for every one of us. Always keep that in mind. Now, yet when the Holy Spirit descended and indwelt them, there was a radical change. Think about Saul on the road to Damascus being blinded, and then not only later his physical sight being restored, but his spiritual sight being granted to him. Spiritual sight is more important than physical sight. Well, I couldn't get around it. I couldn't see. Well, maybe you'd see a whole lot more if you had spiritual insight, okay? Keep this in mind. That's another basic, all right? From that point on, none of them were ever the same. I can say that with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it makes an absolute difference. I know um, this Sunday uh, at the call to come forward for prayer, um, there was a request from the congregation 
for a specific need in the family, not their family, but another family, and that entire family came up and stood. Well, normally I'm giving the oil to anoint with, anoint with, okay? Well, and then another family came up. There were, I won't say, three or four families represented here at the altar, and they were all anointed. And during the anointing, I felt the Spirit just completely come over. I know that they found it. Or I hope they did. I hope they were seeking that reassurance that we are standing before the Lord, we are accepting the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and we are standing in faith and believing that what we've asked God for, God is going to deliver. But if He doesn't deliver what we've asked for, He's going to deliver Himself to each need that has been voiced here. It's a very powerful experience when you can feel the power of the Holy Spirit come over. That was just a moment in the service when the need started out that was great and then other needs felt moved to come forward and to be a part of it. Now, we know that outside a multitude had gathered and they thought that they were drunk and, and Peter goes out and he preaches a tremendous, tremendous message. And it says that on that day around 3,000 people became part of God's kingdom and accepted the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize the Holy Spirit is a gift? It's a gift. Not everybody has that. Well, I really think that I want to have the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, I really think that I want a Cadillac, so I'm going to park my Chevy in the garage, and I'm going to believe that it's going to be a Cadillac. You can want something, but unless God prepares you and anoints you, you can want things. If you're not ready for them, God's not going to deliver those things to you. You need to be ready. How, so, so you're asking me this morning, so Brenda, how do I prepare to receive the Holy Spirit? How close are you to God? Are you reading His Word? Are you praying? Most Tuesdays, I pray the whole way. Now, when I say things like, I study the Word every morning, that's not to brag. That's a necessity. Do you eat your breakfast in the morning? Do you eat a meal during the day? That's my spiritual food. It is necessary for me to live that I'm in the Word every morning. Now, everybody else may not be called to read the Word, but there are things that go on in my life that I have to seek God for. I do a Bible study every morning. Some of you others are involved in the study as well. But it's very important that I do that first thing in the morning. For me, it sets the tone for the day. It also speaks into what's going on in my life. I'm always amazed by what I'm reading on the printed page has to do with questions or things that I'm seeking God for on all different types of levels. It's really funny. We have our grandson, and we had most of them this for the weekend, but we always have one that has to stay and have to have a little extra time with granddaddy. And yesterday, um, I had a renter move out on Sunday, and that very same house, a renter was moving in Monday morning. So I was scrambling to get a lease together. They were getting their water. They were getting their electricity. They were doing this. Andrew was back and forth. Granddaddy was doing some things or whatever. He said, Grandma, you've been at this all morning. What are you doing? And I told him. And he said, and it takes that much time, Grandma? I said, well, I'm talking to one renter on text who have gone to New York and taken the keys to the house, forgot to leave the keys. I'm talking to another renter that's wanting to get in. I'm talking to the property manager who's going, do I let them have my keys so we can get in the house? I said, I have to meet with them. I have paperwork to do. He said, but Grandma, you've done this all morning long. And I said, yeah, Grandma, I'm just going to do it until we get it finished. And praise God, it's the hand to the plow. But our lives are so full of so many worldly things. But they're all a part of it. I was very blessed that when I got to the house and started talking to the new people that moved in, how they understood God's timing. 
how blessed they were because they had actually wanted this house several months back and were not able to get it. And the people that moved out were only there for three months. But God blessed them to be able to go back home in a roundabout way. You know, sometimes we look at things and, and we just, oh, that's just horrible. But if you let go and let God, you will be amazed at what He can do in your life. So, now, the Holy Spirit is a person. In John 14 and 17, we read that the Spirit dwells with you and will be in you. And this calls us to relationship with the Spirit. Instead of allowing us to think we can treat the Spirit as a power to be harnessed to accomplish our own purposes. We live in a world of our own purposes. Well, I think I'm just going to go down here to the restaurant, kick the door in, and I'm going to clean out the freezer because I need to stop my, my freezer. That makes no sense. Turn on the television, and that's what's going on. I'm amazed by the foolishness in the world today. The Holy Spirit is a person who has personal relationships with not only believers, as we have seen, but also with the Father and the Son. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Understand they are three separate, but understand they are one supernaturally, spiritually connected. If we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, are we connected to the Holy Spirit through the Son to the Father? Have you ever thought about it that way? You absolutely, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are connected to Jesus Christ the Son, connected to God the Father. What a tremendous thing that is. Second, we need to understand is the Holy Spirit is not only a person, but the Holy Spirit is God. Is God. He is not lesser. He is not different. He is the same as God the Father, God the Son. The Spirit is God. The words Spirit and God are used interchangeably in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit is prevalent in the New Testament. Somewhat of a shadow, just as Jesus Christ is shadowed in the Old Testament, as is the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, Jesus is revealed, the Holy Spirit is revealed, and the Holy Spirit is with us in dwelling us. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, third, third, the Holy Spirit is eternal forever and ever. Amen. And is holy. We read where Jesus has given them the promise. Um, that the Holy Spirit will be with us forever. Never leads us, never forsakes us. And in Hebrews we read that it was through the eternal spirit that Jesus was able to offer himself unblemished to God. Now let me explain that. Jesus was sinless. But it is because of the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is sinless. Okay? Do you understand that? Just as he enables us for our minds and our hearts to be open and receptive to God's word. Fourth, the Holy Spirit has his own mind and he prays for us. Romans 8, Romans 8, 27 says, He who searches hearts, see God knows our hearts. He knows what's in your heart. You might can hide it from everybody else, but God knows. He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes. In other words, the Spirit goes before us, takes us into what is necessary to be what God has called us to be. All right? Intercedes for the saints. Now get a load of this. According to the will of God. This is where so many people mess up. They don't understand the will of God. This world is not about you. And that's what's going on in the world today. It's me, me, me. Now, now, now. 
It's horrible. So don't tell me that this word that we are receiving in this little book is not what we need for today in order to live an abundant life in this world. Remember, an abundant life is the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Do you know what real love is? Love. Joy. Uh, do you have joy? Do you have peace? And there's times that our loved ones get on our nerves. There's times that the devil steals our joy. We have to grab it back. We've got to jerk it back from it. Our peace. I hate to be torn up about something. Be agitated. Love, joy, peace, kindness. Do you show kindness? Are you good? Are you a good person? Okay, these are things. The Holy Spirit has his own mind. So many times in life, in life, we forget to pray. We forget to pray. And then there's times that we pray for stupid things. We pray for stupid things, unnecessary things. And it's the loving indwelling of the Holy Spirit that guides us back to the things that are important to our spiritual walk. Our spiritual walk. Now, fifth, the Spirit has emotions. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. When you act out, when you sin, when you say and do things that are not pleasing to God, you grieve the Holy Spirit. We have emotions and the Holy Spirit has emotions. Understand that. God created feelings and like anything else they can be misused and they can be abused. But the intended purpose of feelings come from God. He created emotions which is why it's difficult to believe that the Holy Spirit has emotions. The Spirit is grieved when there is a breach in a relationship, whether it is a relationship with God or a relationship with other people. When we are dis unified, unloving, hateful, jealous, gossiping, that is when we grieve the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to stop at five today because I'm going to close with something that I think is, is really important. And it came to me this morning as I was studying. Christian people, have you ever heard it said that Christian people are the worst? It's also a statistic that probably 90-something percent in the church are all there for the wrong reasons. They do not have a heart for God. It's position, social standing. Yes, I was in church last Sunday, and so-and-so, so-and-so. But what did the preacher preach on? I can't think of it for the life of me. I can't remember for the life of me what the preacher preached on. Well, what were you doing? I think I dozed off. Grieve in the Holy Spirit. Grieve in the Holy Spirit. Yes, Christian people can be some of the worst. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God. He knows your heart. Now, if you don't feel like you're loved or you have love in your life, you need to examine your relationship with God. If you feel like your joy is just a little bit, you need to examine it. Well, you know, my family. No, it's not your family. It's not your family. It's you. Remember, let me go back to the beginning. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is personal. Well, you know, my grandmother was a Pentecostal holiness preacher, and I know that's why no has nothing to do with why I'm called to do what I'm called to do. It is my relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that puts me sitting before you this morning. So ask yourself if the fruit of the Spirit, and go back and study that in Galatians, go back and study that. If the fruit of the Spirit is missing in your life, it's your fault. Well, I really don't have a good preacher. No, it's your fault. You don't need a preacher to get in God's Word. 
Well, you know, I, I really wasn't raised in church. No excuse. If you're here today under the sound of my voice and your life is miserable, it's your fault. You have nobody to blame but yourself. I see people shaking their heads yes in here. It's a choice. It's a choice. There's such joy in the Word. There's such power in the Word. We can walk in joy. We can walk in power. We can command the evil spirits to flee. In love, we can show people Jesus. Do you realize that possibly you may be the only Jesus that somebody sees today? Mm -hmm. You may be the only Jesus. So how are you going to walk in the world today? Let us pray. Father, we just love you so much this morning. and We thank you for your word that guides us and directs us. Lord, we thank you for the, your word that corrects us, Father. There's so many times that in the flesh that we fail you, Father. And I ask for forgiveness for myself and for anyone else under the sound of my voice, Father. We know that there are times that we choose to disobey, Father. I know that I do that. So, Lord, I know that there's grace. I know that there's mercy. Father, I know that you can lift us out of these things, put our feet right back on your path of righteousness, Lord, that you can show us who we need to be in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you for an abundant life. An abundant life, Father, where I can see the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the goodness, all of those things, Father, that you have given to me through your Holy Spirit. So, Father, now just continue to show us your will in our lives, and we will give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for it, and you alone, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.